Good morning. It is May 5th, and it looks like we're finally uh, getting out of what has been a rather depressing couple of weeks, both mm -hmm. with temperatures and moisture. Uh, but the conditions have not been ideal for grass growth. Our recovery from any activities that have been ongoing, but the forecast looks to be a little bit more promising. Uh, on today's Turf Grass Team Times from the Ohio State University, we've got Dr. Tyler Carr, Dr. Dave Shetler, Pam Charette, and the inimitable Mr. Todd Hicks. Uh, Mr. Hicks, disease and destruction, take it away. Morning, everybody. Hope you're all doing well. Um, as far as disease-wise, it's been eerily quiet so far. Um, I think the weather has had diseases kind of off balance. Um, in speaking to turf managers throughout the state, it, we are seeing leaf spot already on golf courses and some lawns. Uh, no real reports of red thread. Northeast Ohio has had some watia patch dealing with. But, but nothing really big. And finally, I think there's a little leftover pink snow mold from our winter in this wet weather. But again, it's not really an issue. And with this warm weather, it's going to go away. I think the two things I'd be worried about right now are red thread and leaf spot. Red thread for the lung care side of things and leaf spot for everybody managing turf. Because as we know, if we get this thing, it's going to stick with us all summer long. And in the fall, it's a pioneer disease. Once it weakens the turf, it makes it much easier for things like anthracnose and, and dollar spots to come in and cause real, real bad problems. Um, the two things on the horizon that I'd be spraying for in the next seven days, if I had to, would be dollar spot and anthracnose. Uh, dollar spot, as we know, is always a problem. It's always something you want to get out in front of and be ahead of it instead of behind it. And anthracnose, because last year, that was the number one problem I got from golf course was anthracnose. So if you've had a history or you're susceptible to it at all, I'd get something out there, maybe a combination spray with my dollar spot, leaf spot stuff so that I could sleep better at night. And one last thing I got to worry about with this upcoming warm patch. But so far, so good uh, as, again, it's eerily quiet, but I expect that to change rather quickly with this warm up. That's all I got, Ed. That's a good, a good point Ray, uh, regarding the leaf spot, Todd. We noticed yesterday on our ODA trial, particularly with the ryegrass, that there was a couple of cultivars starting to show some uh, negative impacts from leaf spot. And, and it was I, I think in the higher cuts, it's there, but it's so minor, people aren't seeing it. I, I got some great pictures this morning off a of golf course that you didn't have to look at it very far from a distance. You could tell it. And as we all know, there are cool season and warm season leaf spots. They interchange readily with the weather. And I think the, the warm season one tends to be a little stronger in Ohio. So as this heat warms up and it switches, I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Thank you, Todd. All right, Pamela Sherat, who's undoubtedly getting ready for the coronation this weekend. <laughs> uh, I think the less said about that, the better. <laughs> okay, uh, moving on. Um, okay, so I wanted to say good morning to everybody. Um, it has been a, kind of a weird couple of weeks with the cool, wet weather, uh, but it's been great for establishing grass. I've seeded a couple of weeks ago and seen some great results with uh, germination and establishment. I will say with this warm spell coming up, not to back off on the syringing cycles, because even though we have had a lot of rain, <clears throat> the surface dries out really, really quickly. Um, I've got an area in my yard that's been hydro mulched by the city, and so it does retain some moisture, but it's just noticed even this morning that it's starting to look really dry. So uh, keep on with the syringing if you have a stab, if you are establishing grass. So I took this picture last night. Um, the fields are looking great. As we know, May is the best time to grow grass. The cool, our cool season grasses love this weather. They do really well. Um, the role of a turf manager, as we all know, and we teach our students right now is to build roots from now until the stressful time in summer. So Try and, try and avoid high rates of nitrogen and things like that. Um, I know that Dr. Carr is going to talk a little bit more about management at this time of year. So I just wanted to show this picture that feels are looking great right now. Some pictures I took in my neighborhood this morning. Um, I love my neighborhood because it's so eclectic and we have people that love their lawns and we have people that um, despise lawns and we have those in between that kind of Kind of do a little bit of both, which is, I think is where I would land. Uh, I like to have some flowers in my lawn, um, but I also, you know, I like my lawn and I enjoy the lawn care. So um, 
we know that there is a movement right now, uh, No Mo May, and I just wanted to offer some thoughts on that. Um, first of all, Dr. Gardner and Dr. Nangle are, um, have started a study on this topic, and so more of that to come in future turf team times and possibly at field day. So um, there is a study ongoing to look at this topic and, you know, the pros and cons and, and what the implications would be if we don't mow lawns. Um, I think there is a misconception that if you don't mow, it somehow turns into a native prairie. And we know that that's not true. Um, chances are you're going to have invasive species come in. But I understand, you know, beauty is in the eye of the beholder and what people do on their landscape is, is, obviously, um, is obviously their choice. What I really like in, in my neighborhood, some of the parks and rec areas and the athletic fields will have these no-mo zones that have been set aside purposefully for to increase biodiversity. So this is one uh, locally that I, I stop at sometimes. I like to go because there's birds. I'll see birds in this area like red winged blackbirds that I won't see in my yard because we have these taller grasses in this taller vegetation. So, you know, it's nice to increase biodiversity and see these kinds of things and see different wildlife uh, in these areas. Word of caution, though, um, and I'm speaking from experience here. My family went camping last weekend and one of them came home with a tick embedded in their back. So. Um, this extension bulletin came out this came out uh, last this week, first of May. Um, if you want to follow the Ohio State University extension on social media, that is their address there on the screen. Uh, I think they posted this on Facebook, probably on Twitter too. Um, and this is the quote from them: it, it, "To try and prevent ticks around your personal landscape is to keep the yard mode." Um, and so, this is a really nice article. It talks about all the, the new ticks that we have now in Central Ohio, um, how you can prevent them, what, how you can sort of go backpacking and hiking um, safely, what to wear, etc. And I know Dr. Shetler is going to talk next. Our entomologist is going to talk next, so I'll let him um, expand on this a little bit, but. In my community, we have a lot of deer. Uh, we had a lot of we have a lot of rabbits. We have a lot of um, uh, these no mow areas, and we we have this. There's a lot of people in my neighbourhood that have taken on this, you know, no mow May, and I'm starting to see these lawns get longer and longer. And so, just a word of caution, really, if if this is something that you want to do for your landscape, be prepared uh, to deal with things like ticks. So, with that, I am stopping the share. Dr. Nangle. And one quick plug, um, they've just announced June 27th will be the, awesome. the Ohio Sports Field Managers Conference field day at OSU Athletics. So look out for more details on that. And I hope to see you there. All right. I, maybe it's me and my internet connection is unstable. However, we're carrying on. No editing <laughs> here. Pam, you made, a, you made a good point about syringing cycles. Was it being so dry right now, like with relative humidity being so low? I was just looking that ET over the next week is going to be about 1.2 inches, which is it's about 0.17 inches per day. And, you know, I think we see probably about point. 1.8 to 0.22 daily here during the summer um, with the, the elevated humidity. And so that's, you know, you're going to see some some turf getting a little droughty um, if, it, if it has weaker root systems. All right, Dr. Carr. Dr. Shetler, death and destruction from the insect standpoint. Yeah, I'd like to, to do a quick update on, on a couple of the insects. Uh, obviously, the annual bluegrass weevils have been up, at least in the southern half of the state, for probably a month now. Uh, but with the cool weather, they were just sort of hanging out. But uh, in this warm weather, they, they are up. Uh, the weevil tracks and other things are pointing out that the adults uh, have started laying eggs. Remember that the females... Uh, have this extensible ovipositor and they actually slide eggs in the leaf sheath uh, of, of the uh, annual bluegrass and then those eggs uh, take uh, about five days to hatch out and the larva burrow up and down through that stem. So uh, we're kind of in that transition where you can apply insecticides to kill the adults, but you probably also need to have an insecticide that has some systemic activity uh, to kill the larvae in the stems. 
uh, some of the ones for those, uh, the, these are the ones that uh, are sort of what I call late preventive, early curative uh, treatments. Uh, my favorites actually are, are clothianidin uh, plus bifenthrin uh, as a loft. In other words, that combination product. The beauty of having the combination is that you take out any weevils that might have been missed uh, earlier, uh, and then the systemic component of it will kill the larvae. Now, there are other ones uh, that are recommended. Uh, Cyantronyloprol or Ferenc uh, is, is highly systemic and, and moves very rapidly in the plant. Uh, and and uh, it also can kill the adults uh, by itself. Uh, now you'll notice that acelaprin is not on this list. Uh, I'm not a real fan of acelaprin for the annual bluegrass weevil uh, control. It's, it's great for other material or other uh, critters, but uh, when it comes to the annual bluegrass weevil, if, if you're going to use a diamide, uh, the, the Ferenc and the Tetrino seem to have much better activity. Uh, another thing for those of you that are in the lawn care, especially, but other areas where you're growing primarily Kentucky bluegrass, uh, uh, bluegrass billbugs have been up and out. Again, uh, the females and the males have just kind of been hanging out in the cool weather. But uh, in this warm weather that's coming up over the next two weeks, um, the females will be seeking out. Uh, they seem to prefer the seed head stems that come up at this time of the year. Remember that the female chews a little hole in that seed head stem. She sticks an egg, an individual egg in that, and then the larva hatches out and burrows down through that stem, gets down to the crown usually by late May, early June, uh, and kills the crown of the plants. And, and so uh, bluegrass billbugs can cause significant damage uh, typically in, in that late uh, May, early June window. Uh, again, if we're gonna do some treatments for this one, uh, virtually any of the neonicotinoids will work on these, but remember if you're using imidacloprid or thiamethoxam, merit or meridian at this time of the year, uh, they're gonna run out of steam. There won't be any residues left in July uh, to kill the grubs. And, and so my feeling is if you're going to use these cheaper materials, these cheaper neonicotinoids, uh, strictly go for the grubs in late June through July with those products. On the other hand, Arena does have the staying power. We know that if you apply that in May, there's a significant residues in late June and early July to kill the grubs. Uh, same thing with our, our diamides, uh, the acelaprin, the Ferenc, and the Tetrino. Uh, all of these are good uh, uh, bluegrass billbug control materials, and they have the staying power uh, to uh, be in that soil thatch interface to kill the grubs uh, later on in, in the uh, uh, season. Okay, uh, that's all I've got in, on the insect update when it comes to the, the ticks. Uh, I think a lot of people don't realize that many of our urban habitats are ideal for ticks uh, because uh, uh, remember ticks have three stages. They have a larval stage that just hatches out of the egg. The larva prefers a small mammal uh, and, and it's gonna be uh, rats, mice, voles, uh, chipmunks, uh, rabbits, the, the, those kinds of animals. Those are also the reservoirs. The, that's where the endemic uh, uh, population of Lyme disease occurs, as well as several other diseases. So the tick larva picks up the disease from the small rodent. After they fed, drop off, molt into the, the nymphal tick. The nymphal tick now has the infection of that disease and can transmit it to larger animals. And also in our urban habitats, as, as uh, uh, Pam had, had indicated, uh, we've got plenty of deer around. So we've got larger mammals. Uh, we don't realize, unless you're out at nighttime, that we also have a lot of skunks, uh, raccoons, and, and possums. Uh, and those are also the secondary uh, hosts uh, for the, these ticks. So we've got this ideal habitat. And, and of course, as was indicated on that fact sheet, what do ticks love? Well, they love high cut uh, areas or no cut areas, uh, primarily because ticks are really susceptible to drought. So they need uh, cover then and high grassy areas 
provide them that moist uh, cover uh, to, uh, in order to survive. So uh, I'm not a real fan of the no mow may. I, th I think we're going to see some blowback in, in terms of uh, some of the, the pestiferous critters. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm all for pollinators, but I also have to keep an eye open for these other critters. That's all I've got, Ed. Thank you, Dr. Shatner. All right, Dr. Carr. I love the use of the word pestiferous. I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to use that. Um, so a couple of us were uh, involved with the COSI Weaver Scientist event that was held at Waterman uh, Farm at the new Controlled Environment Center. Uh, there were over 400 people there, so it was it was a good turnout, and uh, we had um, about 300 square feet of sod that was donated uh, by Columbus Turf that we set on the concrete and had a mower so people could take pictures. Uh, Pam had a, a ero an erosion um, simulation uh, set up for, for, for these attendees to look at, and we had all kinds of different testing equipment there. So it was cool to get to interact with people uh, in the community. In an event like that, I think it was pretty successful. Um, so switching gears to, to what we're seeing around the state and turf, my Twitter feed is blowing up with people airifying right now. Um, and I know it's, it's pretty common to add nitrogen prior to your airification or just after your airification to increase that, that recovery. Um, but we do need to remember that when you increase nitrogen, you're also increasing soil organic matter. And if your goal of aeration is to reduce soil organic matter, uh, there needs to be a balancing act, right? Um, if, if you want to pull those cores and add that nitrogen, you may be increasing that rate of soil organic matter accumulation. So there are some other ways to deal with soil organic matter, um, especially in putting greens, and that'd be uh, through dilution with sand top dressing. Um, now, I know a lot of people love sand top dressing on putting greens because it just shreds mower blades and reels. Um, some things that some people have been doing in the South on Bermuda grass greens for 20 years is using finer sands for top dressing. Um, a lot of these coarse materials that we have on top dressing sands don't get worked into the canopy very well. And so they sit on the surface and when you mow, um, it's collected. And so when I say fine sands, I mean part of, uh, no particles um, in the very coarse range. So that's a one to two millimeter range. On the coarse side, there's a range, 15 to 40%, 50% medium sand, but no more than 25% fine sand. So if you have a too much fine sand, it can increase the soil moisture at the surface. Um, now, availability of these, uh, you know, there are areas in Ohio that have these products available. They can screen them to meet these specifications. I always get questions about layering. Um, you know, if you're putting if you're putting this finer material on top of your your coarser material, are we concerned about layering? The work that's been done on this at Rutgers has demonstrated really no negative effects in terms of layering. Uh, the recommendation is if you do hollow tie cultivate to add a material um, that matches your existing root zone material. So if you have a, a USGA spec green. Um, go back in with a USGA sand when you're um, filling those holes. If you have a sand base, I mean, a soil based green, just come back in with a more coarse material to match um, what you what you have. So that's just kind of something to put on your radar. Um, I know it's it's going to be more expensive and it may not be for everybody, but um, essentially you're you, you're incorporating finer sand into your mix regardless because you're oftentimes pulling off the uh, the course material. All right, that's all I have. Thank you, Dr. Carr. I'm sure Dr. Carr will be pleased to that. Uh, okay, we are going to wrap up. The only thing that we wanted to mention is with warmer temperatures, um, watch the formulations of your herbicides. So if you've been using esters, which are generally more efficacious, uh, then that's all well and good. But now when we get these hotter temperatures, 
a movement to a mean formulation would be much safer for uh, any of the non-target species that you might be applying to. Um, and remember, if you do make a mistake with that, generally humans make mistakes in straight lines. If it's a biological issue, it's going to be sporadic and spread all over. So normally that's the neighbor's dog leaving a mark when, you, when that happens. Uh, Without further ado, and much less uh, pomp and circumstance, and that's a nod towards tomorrow on the weekend, Pamela, uh, we will leave you and uh, we will look forward to seeing you all next week. Dr. Carr is just leaving up, if you have uh, questions, he's leaving up contact details uh, where we will be able to answer your questions um, uh, in a very timely manner. Thank you, and we will talk to you all soon.